All right, let's dive in. So thank you for joining us today for Palo Alto University, our PhD in Counselor Education and Supervision or CES program overview. Your hosts today include myself, Krista Kaur. I'm the program manager for the CES program in our Department of Counseling. I'm joined today by Dr. Margaret Lamar, our associate professor and associate department chair for the CES program, Department of Counseling. Oh, just a couple more people coming from the waiting room, admitting those folks. We also have Robin Martinez with us today, our senior admissions counselor. So thank you all for being here. And let's dive right in. Margaret, I'll hand it over to you. Oh, I think you're muted, Margaret. Thank you. Thank you. Zoom was reminding me as well. Um, we are so excited to be starting this PhD in counselor education and supervision. This has been a long time coming. We've been working on this for years. And so it's hard to believe that our launch is finally here. Um, we are excited to be really the first residentially based CES program in California. So happy to offer many of you who are from California and not wanting to go to the other side of the country for a CES program. We're so happy that you'll be able to now stay in California. Our first cohort is going to start next fall. So uh, we'll get to the application part later. If you'd like to be a part of that first cohort, we would love to have you. Our mission statement and really all of our conversation and um, work building this program is really centered around our mission statement, which is that we are aiming to prepare doctoral students to become culturally affirming counselor educators and supervisors. Our program strives to move the counseling profession into the future by training leaders who promote anti-oppressive pedagogy, scholarship, supervision, advocacy, and practice. And we I really do. We are really excited about the, the way that we're creating this program to be able to help you to do those things. Um, we are really thinking about and talking about what does our profession need to look like in 30 years? We don't want to train you for what people are doing right now, but we really want to be thinking about what, what is it that you need to be doing in the year 2050? What is it counselors need to be able to do in 30 years? How can we train you to be thinking and, and ready to be training in the future as everything around in the world is changing so quickly? And I think that's all for that slide. There you go. Great. Who should apply? We're looking for licensed professional counselors, graduates of KCREP accredited counseling programs, school counselors, marriage and family counselors, and of course Zoom popped up right over the next bullet point, uh, associate professional clinical counselors or postgraduate counselors working towards licensure. Um, please note that you do not have to be licensed to apply for this program. And even if um, you did not attend a program, a master's program that was KCREP accredited, that doesn't mean you can't apply. It just means that we're going to be helping you in the application process to ensure that your schooling did in fact meet KCREP accredited, um, KCREP accredited requirements for us. And let me go on here. So are you a good fit for the CES program? Are you collaborative and eager to learn? Are you in alignment with our mission and values? Please note that you don't need to be a researcher, published author, or teacher. We will help you develop these skills. And ultimately, we are looking for our future colleagues. All right. So this is a residentially based program. I know many of you are uh, were in our distance learning master's program. Um, this one is going to be primarily residentially based. We will have some work on uh over Zoom, distance learning kind of work, but we're really primarily going to be focused or located on one of our two campuses in Palo Alto. So we, or I guess our Mountain View campus in Palo Alto, which is actually in Mountain View. But anyway, our, we have two lovely campuses. Um, if you haven't been around PAU for a while, our Mountain View campus is gorgeous. It's this new space that we're in and it's lovely. Um, so while we are going to be residential, and have some components on Zoom, we really are designing this program for working professionals. So if you're a licensed counselor, you're a counselor working in schools, you are a 
an associate counselor trying working on your licensure hours, we're really trying to design this program so that you can still engage in your clinical work and do this program. So we're trying to have our classes meet on one to two days a week or, you know, um, like one full day and maybe a half day. Uh, that's sort of what it'll look like so that you can work in, again, out in the community, private practice agency, and be able to carry a pretty you know, decent load of clients while you're also uh, working your way through the program. Meet the counseling department leadership. We have Dr. Donna Shapiris, a professor and department chair, also our PAU eClinic director, Dr. Margaret Lamar, who's with us today, associate professor, associate department chair for the CS program, Dr. Darlene Chen, Associate Professor, Associate Department Chair for the MA in Clinical Mental Health Counseling Program. Seems like some of you on the call today might be familiar with these folks. And we also have Sarah Everly, our Department Manager. And here is the counseling department, both staff and faculty. This photo was taken a couple of weeks ago at our department retreat. Margaret, would you like to share more about our counseling department? Yeah, we are so excited. We had just just had five new faculty join us this last fall, um, and they are just lovely, lovely humans. Um, everyone in our faculty is lovely. We we have faculty that want from other institutions that say, "Let me know if you have a job," because um, we just really w work really well together and get along. And these are a bunch of very passionate, um, student focused educators. Um, a diverse group of folks in terms of their intersectional identities, but also in terms of, you know, what they're teaching, what their clinical specialties are and their research approaches. Um, so you will find different faculty to connect with in terms of what you're interested in learning more about, what you're interested in researching. Um, we are really excited about all of the, um, the, the things that this faculty bring to the program and are in fact are really trying to be intentional so that you get to learn from as many of these faculty as possible. Um, because, you know, getting all these different viewpoints and perspectives is going to just make you a stronger educator and supervisor in the future. All right, so turning it on for to coursework. So please note that this program is designed to be completed in three years. Our program is designed for working professionals. Ideal candidates will have a schedule that allows them to attend class one to two days a week. At this time, the program does not allow for part-time students. And if you have any concerns about the schedule, please reach out to us so we can talk with you about you know, creating a plan of study and options that would work for you. Yeah, and while our program is um, not designed to be part-time, really that just means that, um, you know, if you were in our master's program, it's it's about the same amount of actual units per quarter. It's about 10, 10 units a quarter, two, two classes plus an internship class. Um, so it's a pretty manageable load over a three-year period. And, um, and as you move through the coursework or, or through the plan of study, it's really designed to, as you get busier with your research, your coursework gets less and less. So um, you start out with more coursework. And then as you go through the program, it gets less and less. And your research um, starts, you know, taking up more of your time. So um, we feel that it's pretty manageable, um, but of course, uh, let us know if you have concerns. Um, so the doctoral counselor education and supervision doctoral coursework, it looks a little different if you've come from a master's program, a KCREP master's program. So we have uh, five primary components that we are really looking to teach to. Um, and some of these we focus on maybe a little bit more than others. So we are, the first one is teaching. We want you to be trained to be an incredible counselor educator, um, whether you're going to go into a faculty position or whether you're going to build a clinical practice and then teach at a local institution or maybe an online institution to share um, your clinical skills with, with up and coming counselors. So 
we have coursework around, um, and, and we really, again, have thought about, you know, what is it that you actually need to be able to do? We really want you to walk out of this program already doing the things um, that you would do as a faculty member or as a as a um, organizational leader. So some of our coursework titles I've put on the side here, creating transformative educational experiences through pedagogy theory and practice. Um, we've already got our faculty working on developing this course, these courses right now, and they are looking incredible. Um, supervision is another key component of this, of the doctoral coursework. So at the master's level, you've really focused on becoming a clinician and developing that part of yourself. Now we want you to be able to supervise and we have an extensive um, curriculum um, or work around supervision. And then you'll also learn how to learn how to teach supervision. So it's kind of multiple components there. Um, the third one is counseling. Again, this is really more about building on the skills that you developed at the master's level. It's not a huge focus of the doctoral coursework because you've had a 60 hour master's program focusing on building your counseling skills. Uh, but we do have, I did not put this title over there, but we have one that's about sort of advanced counseling skill and group leadership. So uh, we're looking forward to, to um, uh, and, and also I think there's a component of maybe doing some e-counseling. So if you uh, di digital like distance counseling, so um, working with the e-clinic to do that. Leadership and advocacy is a huge component of the doctoral coursework. Uh, we really want you to be able to go out and take on leadership roles, whether that's in an organization, whether it's in an academic department or out in professional organizations. Um, we have a couple of courses we're really excited about. They're the bottom two stars. They're developing strong leadership and advocacy skills to navigate higher education and community organizational cultures, and then effective leadership and counseling through assessment, accreditation, program development, and inclusive human resource management. Again, these two classes, we are really trying to get into the nuts and the bolts of what we do as counselor educators. And I did not have, you know, how to run a program or how to lead a department or how to, you know, work in a higher education institute as a leader. I didn't have that kind of training. And I think we talked to a lot of faculty um, they said, yeah, I didn't. I just kind of learned it as I got into the roles. And so we want you to be able to walk out of here understanding the complexities of working in community and organizational systems and be able to lead those effectively. So we're really excited about that. Then finally, our research and scholarship, that's usually the one that everyone's the most scared about, um, is that research piece. But we are planning, we have a whole curriculum guide that's really thoughtfully planned and put together to walk you through the, the and develop, help you develop as a researcher. Um, so we're trying to think of things that are, or create experiences that are really appropriate for you when you're first coming in and then building and scaffolding your skills until you're able to do independent research on your own. And I want to talk about sort of with all of this, there's sort of three components um, in this middle circle, you'll see coursework, internship, and extracurriculars. So all of these five components have courses that are specifically related to them. There's also an internship component. And if you're feeling a little flashback to your master's program, it's definitely a different internship experience. Um, I'll talk about that. And then we're also creating experiences outside the classroom within our program or within our department that can boost your learning. So uh, this could be things like um, all of our faculty will have research groups that all students will be connected and to put into at the beginning of the time in the program. And so you'll get to learn and be part of a research group, learn the process, you know, be given different tasks to do so that you can develop those uh, research skills that are so important to us as um, as scholars. Uh, then a couple of other things that I want to just make sure I mention is that, um, you know, PAU is very, um, uh, what is the word? We have a real commitment to our diversity, equity, inclusion, and belonging. It's a huge component of our strategic plan. And every part of our university 
talks about and thinks about and works on how we are using this as a framework. And that's not any different for our department. And I think our, our, the counseling department does incredible work. The faculty have been regular, have regularly have dialogues about, um, diversity, equity, and inclusion in our work, in the work we're doing with students, um, and then in the work we're doing out in the communities. It's really something that we do on a regular basis. The There was something else I was going to say about that. Um, oh, so when we think about, just like we think about, you know, when we're doing this program, what is it that we want you to be able to do in the future? Not training you to today, but training you for, you know, a decade from now or more. The same thing is true with our diversity, equity, inclusion, and belonging work. We are not, this is not an add-on like, oh, we've talked about this. Now let's talk about it from a, a DEI perspective, but it's really a foundational component of this course. So everything that you're going to learn about supervision, about teaching, about leadership and advocacy, about research is going to come from a DEI lens. And in addition, we will also have specific coursework. So we've got a couple of our faculty developing this really incredible course about developing advanced skills and applying DEI competency to all of these components. So really excited about that and excited about the opportunity for our students to really come out of this program and able to speak to power and privilege and equity and inclusion. Um, another aspect of the coursework, I know this is like the, the meat of it, so I know I'm taking up a lot of time, but um, we have the internship program that I mentioned. Um, we have a 600-hour internship. A lot of that internship actually happens within it happens within the department for the most part. So you'll get it, you'll have a teaching internship. So you'll get an opportunity to go co-teach with a faculty member and learn how do they develop their syllabus? How do they, you know, think about what they're going to do on a weekly basis? Um, you know, what are the topics that they cover? How do they address difficult topics in their classrooms? You'll do that co-teaching experience to learn, you know, what is it like teaching? Um, when I was a doc student, I tried to teach with as many different people as I could because I wanted to learn all the different ways that people prepped for their classes, how they organized things, how they approach different conversations. It's really helpful to get a, a variety of views. So teaching internships, part a part of, of the whole internship process. Um, there will be opportunities for supervision internships, counseling internships, leadership and advocacy internships, and then research internships. So thinking about you know working with those research groups um, and getting some internship credit for that. So it's all very, um, you know, uh, it, it's all kind of collated into the program. So it's not like you're going to have a, a year, you know, like your practicum or internship year where you sort of spent a lot of time out, out you know, kind of getting all those hours collected and stressing about client, direct client hours. This is all going to be sort of built in from the very first quarter that you get here. Um, and then finally, I want to talk about our multiple article dissertation. This is something we are really excited about. Um, there are not uh, I've heard of maybe one other program that uh, does this in their um, program. And this is instead of, let me just show you, this is my dissertation. It's, I don't know, an unreal amount of pages. It's nearly 300 pages. It might be over 300 with the appendix. And I just want you to know that um, this is the first time I've taken this thing out um, since, uh, I don't know, maybe since I put it into the bookshelf. Um, it is not something I've ever had to do again. I've never had to write another 300 page dissertation. Um, and in fact, I think taught me a lot of probably not great writing skills. You know, you don't need a 30 page literature chapter when you're writing a manuscript or an article, you need a, a three page lit review. So we're really excited about this opportunity. A multiple article dissertation is instead of writing this, you know, 300 page behemoth, you actually create a research agenda that can provide you several different articles to write. Um, usually one of those will be a conceptual piece. So just kind of taking ideas from the literature. If you were in my research class, it'd be similar to that poster project. 
and suggesting some ideas for practice. And then two research focused pieces where, again, you've developed these ideas in your classes and you've worked on research in your research groups. And so this, these multiple articles are an extension of that. It's developed out of that. And you can work with faculty, um, you know, maybe there's a group of, of students and faculty that are all working on similar topics, and that could develop into your multiple article dissertation. Um, in counseling, counseling, we really just don't sort of sit by ourselves and do research by ourselves. Um, like when I wrote this dissertation, I sat in a coffee shop in Fort Collins, Colorado for many a, a day uh, and worked by myself. In counseling, we do a lot of collaborative research. Um, we do a lot of different types of research and we really want you to be able to do that and leave this program with you know, some articles already published and getting you on track to continue your research into the future. So again, the coursework that we've designed, the internships that experiences that we have planned, those out of course, out of class, you know, department experiences are all really designed to make you successful at that multiple article dissertation and um, hopefully teach you to write like a really sharp bullet review, not just ramble on for 30 pages. So um, we're really excited about that. We're excited for our students to have a really clear research agenda when they walk out of here um, and to, again, already have some, some articles to your name when you graduate. I think that's, that's it for my section. Oh, no, this is still me. Okay. So I do want to talk about accreditation. Um, so this program is accredited by the Western Association of Schools and Colleges. We use the term WASC. Um, WASC is just a regional accrediting, not just, it's a regional accrediting body and they accredit universities across California. Just say like, hey, yes, you're doing, you know, you're doing all the things that you need to do as a university. So we submitted this program to them. It was approved. The next thing that we're working on is our KCREP accreditation. So you may have come from a KCREP master's. You may have been in our program and heard us talk about KCREP a lot. KCREP is a body, the counseling and related educational programs. They create accreditation standards for counseling programs at the master's and at the doctoral level. And it's similar to what WASC does is they want to say, they say, you know, here are the standards in the counseling field. We want to make sure that as a field, we are training to the same standards. Um, and that is how a lot of state licensing boards um, really trust KCREP accredited programs because they've been um, validated by a, a group of peers. That's what KCREP is made up of as a group of counselors and educators um, who've said, yes, this program meets the standard. So our master's program is uh, was successfully accredited for eight years. We have another accreditation coming up for that. We feel really confident. We have a lot of expert K KCREP experts on our faculty and um, a lot of work going into that. So we, we feel really confident about our master's program getting accreditation for another eight years again, hopefully. Um, our, the, the only thing is you can't program, you can't accredit a program that doesn't quite exist yet. So um, the way that it works for accreditation is that we will apply for, um, we're actually not eligible to apply for KCREP accreditation until we have students entering the dissertation phase of the program. Well, that happens in about year two. Um, so we will be able to start working on our KCREP, or well, we'll be, we're, we're already working on it, but once we have students in, we'll be able to submit for accreditation during that second year. And then we feel, again, really confident about our work in this field, about this program, um, have a lot of expert leadership around there. And so we'll be applying as soon as we're eligible. And if you were here when, I don't know how far back everyone here goes, but if you were here when we first got KCREP accredited, then you would know also about this is that they backdate um, degrees. So, you know, let's say you were to graduate this coming June or you graduated this last June. Um, if, if we got accredited next June, you would still be considered a KCREP accredited degree because they they backdated a certain, it might be around 18 months, I can't remember the exact number, but they backdate 
your uh, accredited your degree so that you have a KCREP accredited program. Um, so that's a little bit about accreditation. If anyone has questions about that, please let us know. Thank you, Margaret. Um, degree application. So our expert faculty, robust internship options and personalized research plans prepare participants for multiple career options. This, these include graduate level teaching and counselor preparation, mental health through research, counseling supervision, organizational leadership and professional organizations, community agencies, K through 12 schools, and higher education settings. So as you can see, this, this our program caters to a lot of different opportunities to help you succeed professionally down the road. And now I will pass it off to Robin to share a little bit more about the admissions requirements for our program. All right. Uh, thank you, Krista. So just to go over the admissions requirements for this program, and also as a reminder, there is a lot more information on our website as well. So first, every applicant will go through an application, which is through SciCast. It is linked also on our website as well. And so everything I list here will all be submitted through there and nothing will be sent directly to Powell University. So first is we ask you to submit a resume or a CV, which could list your training, um, you know, any experience you had in the counseling field or also past employment that is relevant as well as we ask you to submit a personal statement, which is about a thousand words. And some questions that we do ask is, why are you pursuing our CES program, as well as any training and experiences that have prepared you for this program, as well as um, what type of goals and how will this help your goals in the future with pursuing this degree. And you could also read the rest of the personal statement while you're doing your application on SciCast. And another is our recommendation letters. We ask that you submit three recommendation letters. And these, we do ask for them to be either recent or current within the last two years. And we ask them to be from a supervisory or someone that has evaluated you. It could be from professors, advisors, or clinic. And we do ask one of them is from a clinical supervisor. So please keep that in mind. And so anyone that also has managed you as well and has known you in a more professional setting. And we do ask, do not use recommenders that are your colleagues, your friends, your family, um, your personal counselor, those would not do for being recommenders. And we lastly ask that you submit all your official transcripts um, from all the colleges and universities you have attended. And that will also be uploaded through SciCast, the application portal. And some key dates to know is the application deadline to submit everything is January 8th and the interview date will be February 1st and that will be held virtually. And also another important thing about admissions is we are not requiring the GRE as well as we do not do rolling admissions for this program. Thank you, Robin. So taking a deeper look at our interview process. So our CES interviews will be online. It will be a full day on February 1st, 2024. It will include both indiv individual and group sessions. We will invite applicants to interview based on the application review process. So please make sure that your application is fully complete and verified by January 8th. That means all the bullet points that were listed in the previous slide, we will need to have by January 8th. So we encourage you to make sure you reach out to your folks creating your letters of recommendation. Please give them ample time to make sure that we have them by January 8th, as well as the transcripts. These are things that you don't wanna wait for the last minute because you, know, you never know if there'll be a holdup on the other end for those things. And we certainly look forward to reviewing all applications when we get, when we get them in. We already have some people who have begun um, completing their applications and we've been very excited to start reviewing what kind of people are interested in this program and hope to join us. All right. And so we wanted to just uh, our last little piece here before we'll get to questions is about financial aid and advising. Um, so 
any questions that you have about loans, work, study, TA financing options, Dr. Amy Sykes is the interim director of financial aid. So you can send an email to financial aid at paloaltou.edu and someone will talk you through all of the options there. Um, the estimated program a cost is 82,000. That's for the $604. That's the whole amount that's um, estimated for the entire program. Um, you can see the breakdown of tuition and fees. And we are working to, um, this will be a little different than maybe some of our master's folks, um, but we're working working out some of the details on the numbers right now, but to actually divide that out evenly over the entire program so that you can consistently know like every quarter is going to be this amount. Um, and that is usually really helpful for students in terms of budgeting and planning. Um, we are going to have opportunities for assistantships, graduate assistantships, um, as either working with faculty or working in various offices at the institution. Um, we're also really excited. We Our master's program em employs a lot of adjunct. Um, and we are excited to find ways for our doc students to actually um, take on adjunct teaching uh, at the end of the first year uh, so that you know, we can determine what your your expertise is around teaching and help you get all that started and set up. Um, but our adjunct teaching uh, is another opportunity to fund this program. Um, at, we pay our adjuncts pretty well, so um, it's not a bad not a bad deal. And then we also are going to have some scholarshiping, and we will have more information about that as we get closer to the interview day. It is not fully funded. Um, no program at PAU is fully funded, um, but we can help get you close. So um, again, if you have questions. Let us know, talk to financial aid. Um, Lisa Harris is our Associate Director of Student Services and International Military Advising. So if you are an international student, a veteran, st any student with military benefits, uh, you can get in touch with Lisa and she'll answer questions about that for you. Um, otherwise, kind of general advising once you get into the program is you'll be assigned to a faculty member um, and then you'll also be able to choose a different faculty member to be your dissertation chair um, and to kind of guide you through that process. So there's kind of a dissertation advising and then sort of academic advising are a little bit separate. Um, and so when you get here, we'll be able to um, kind of guide you through that process. Thank you, Margaret. All right, and now we're at the question phase. We appreciate all of you listening to our presentation. Um, we will open it up in just a minute. You're welcome to enter your questions in the chat. I see we have a couple in there, or um, you can raise your hand and we can um, ask you to share verbally. If you any other questions come to mind after this session, my email address is listed there. Uh, I welcome you to reach out. If I am not able to answer your question, I am happy to connect you with someone who can. Um, all right, and without further ado, let's see what's in the chat. Oh, okay. so I saw there's an, a question about how many articles are expected from the program during your time in the program for the multiple article dissertation. So a traditional multiple article dissertation, which they do in other fields in, in um, what we'd call the hard sciences. So medicine, um, even some other education fields actually do multiple article dissertations. And typically um, you see around three articles for a dissertation. And so that's what we're going to be aiming for. Um, but there can be flexibility depending on your research agenda and what fits best for you. Um, you know, two pilot studies are, are maybe not the same as like one really large mixed method study. Um, we want this program to set you up for success. And so, you know, if that's part of your research agenda as, you know, this larger, you know, piece that maybe is a little bit unwieldy and, and really fits best into one large manuscript um, or one large article, then we want to make we want to help you be successful in that. So I think we're really interested in this program being able to be tailored through the multiple article dissertation and the internship experience. We really want it to be um, you to be able to tailor it to what you want to do after you graduate. And then I also saw um, uh, this question is for you, Robin, I think. Do master's students or master's graduates need to submit a bachelor's transcript as well? 
Yes. So we ask if you've, you know, attended multiple community colleges uh, where you received grades and then your bachelor's degree and also the master's schools that you've attended. Yes, we ask for you to submit pretty much all your college university history. And um, there's a question, how many students will be in one cohort? Uh, our cohort will max out at 15. So it'll be a small um, group of folks that you'll get to work with throughout your time here. Um, or I guess I should say no more than 15. We anticipate it being between 10 and 15. Um, so what days of the week do you anticipate classes being offered? Oh, that's like the question of the moment, Nadia. We've all been talking about that. Um, we are doing a couple of things with that. So we're really trying to put our courses, our residential courses, make sure they're happening at the same time as our master's classes meet, or not the same time, the same day. Our master's program um, has coursework at night on our campus from six to nine. And so what we really love is for you to come like during the day, do your court, your coursework during the day, and then get to co-teach or teach at night with our students in the master's program. Um, generally, our master's programs have um, classes on Monday, Wednesday, Thursday. We're trying to sort of keep those into the same day. So we're looking at maybe Wednesday and Thursday, but we no guarantees on that. These are just things that we're trying to work out. And as we get to further into the process, we will know. So hopefully by our interview day, we'll have a clearer answer for you on that. I know. So research and internship opportunities available for school counselors. Um, that's a great question. So our research opportunities are going to be the same regardless of what your specialty is. And you'll be able to, we have we have faculty doing research in the schools um, or doing work on, you know, adolescent populations, school aged kind of groups. I'm trying to think, I know Dr. Chen was doing work um, in schools at some point. And so there's, again, different opportunities for different folks, but you'll be able to be plugged in with at least a person who's doing similar research. So even if someone's not out in a school, they're doing work with adolescents, that might be a really good fit. Um, and then you can develop your own school-based research out of that. Um, same thing if you're in some other clinical population, you might not be matched. We might not have the exact match for you in terms of someone doing the exact thing that you want to do. Um, but I think one thing that's really important when we're thinking about faculty and re student research mentorships is really that there's um, it, that it's more than just the population, that it's also a really good fit. Um, someone you might have a great time with and a faculty you really enjoy, or maybe your research interests kind of are close, um, but maybe there's somebody who'd actually be a really, it, it just sort of fits for you better as a mentor and keeps you on track and keeps you focused or has an expertise in a methodology that you're really interested in. Um, and as you work on your dissertation, you'll actually have a committee of folks. So you won't be by yourself. Um, you'll be able to work with, um, and, and it won't be just you and your chair, it'll be you and several other folks. So you can kind of put together a team that works best for you. Um, same thing with our research groups. Um, none of our faculty are doing research independently. So you'll be in a research group that has multiple faculty members involved. Um, and so as we get closer, we'll ask folks who are applying, like, what are your interests? What are some of your think things you might think about? might be a research interest for you. And then we'll try to match you as closely as possible. In terms of internship opportunities, we have in the Bay Area, um, a variety of like clinical internship or supervision internship opportunities is what I'm going to assume you're asking about, Ashley. Um, and so we have a lot of school-based counselor sites uh, in our area. And so it's that's an easy way to plug you in and work with our internship. Um, we have an internship coordinator who oversees all of those sites. And so we can find a site that works best for you in getting some more um, school based um, counseling opportunities. And if you're not from California, school counseling in California is a little bit different. Um, and there's kind of different licenses and um, they just work a little differently. So what you see in California a lot of times is school-based counselors um, and school counselors, but they're kind of both um, doing the same things kind of just depends on the district where you're at. 
So roles that folks seek after a PhD um, can really vary. Uh, we see folks with counselor ed and supervision degrees um, in faculty positions, in academic, other kinds of academic positions. Um, the history of higher education has a lot of people coming from a higher education master's or doctoral degree or a counseling background. Um, that's because our uh, our organizations used to be together. Now we're separate, but um, ACA used to have all these um, higher education um, professionals in it. So you still see a lot of that. So folks in who are deans or provosts, or they're like the director of the counseling center, or their director of undergraduate advising, that kind of thing. Um, also, we see folks with this degree out in schools organization, K-12. Um, so school counselors coming back to get a PhD because they want to move up in their um, in their school, be the director of school counseling services, um, be an assistant um, superintendent, things like that. So organizationally, it provides, the degree can provide people opportunities within their organization in K-12 to move up. Um, and we also see a lot of folks with PhDs in, a, in community spaces. So again, like directors of counseling in large, uh, large community organizations, um, working in other sort of government community organizations, hospitals, those kinds of things, um, or or in private practice. So, uh, you know, you don't need, have to have the PhD to practice. You know, we all are able to be licensed at the master's level, but some folks really want to add to their learning and, and, and develop a research um, component of their work, or they really want to develop a stronger, more robust supervision um, practice so that they can work with counselors, counseling students and associate counselors in all, you know, in their area. Um, so there's, and there's a host of other things, you know, you see people with counseling backgrounds in, um, in HR, uh, and then again, like government, large community organizations. So is it possible to do internship in your current job setting? Absolutely. If you are in a school-based setting, like to your example, Tammy, um, we would love for you to be able to, again, think about how that internship, you can get experience from that for your internship, maybe elevating it, maybe doing um, part of the leadership and advocacy internship is doing, you know, maybe a consultation project or an advocacy project. So how can you work within a community organization to maybe do an evaluation, a program evaluation, or um, to develop, you know, um, an educational program or something like that. So there's lots of opportunities for your internship. So the, this program is currently not, there is not a fully online option. Um, the only option is having that residential component. So we will require some work in the classroom um, as part of our plan of study. Um, and then there's a question, out of the 600 internship hours, how many are direct? Can we use our current direct experience towards them? So this internship is different than the master. So there's not direct or indirect hours. It's just hours. So if you say you co-teach a class with me, you might get 50 to 60 hours of internship time from doing that, from the prep, from you know communicating with students, from being in the classroom teaching, from grading, all of that kind of stuff. You you can you you would get you know say fifty hours of doing that. Maybe you're in a research internship with a faculty member and you're helping write a lit review or helping collect some do you know do interview data collection. You could again you could collect a hundred hours doing that and that's part of your internship. So it's not so much a direct and indirect as it was. Um, there and is more of just giving you experiences that will help you professionally down the road. So the question about um, I'm an associate MFT, can part of the CES internship hours count towards my 3000 LMFT internships hours currently? Um, yes, I believe so. So if you're doing clinical hours for your internship or um, say supervision hours, 
hours. Actually, I don't know if supervision hours would count. Um, I'd have, would have to look more closely at those MFT hours. I'm trying to remember what's required. Um, but I think they do have like an educational component. So you could count some of that absolutely towards your, um, towards your MFT. And, and that's really common for a lot of students to collect their hours while they're there. And then of course, any clinical hours you collect um, during, for your PhD internship, you could account towards your, um, towards your degree. Does this degree allow us to work nationally? So this is, um, thanks for that question. So this is again, separate from the, um, from the licensed at the master's level. So yes, you can work nationally. It doesn't, your actual license ability, that doesn't really change from the master's level. But if you are, say you're interested in working in more of an academic position, you can go anywhere that, you know, that there's a posting that this would you know, make you eligible for. So we see, like, we have faculty here who've come from institutions, you know, in North Carolina or in Idaho, and they've come here using their counselor ed and supervision PhD to work here. But the license, clinical license part is different. So what type of financing and payment options are available to fund this program and can master's credits be transferred to reduce cost. So currently our program of study is distinct and separate from the master's program. So we don't have any um, sort of, uh, I forget there's a word for that where you can kind of like go from one to the other and count sort of dual credit. We don't have anything like that at this point. Um, so it is just the curriculum that you see when you look on our website. It's just those hours that um, you have to get. And none of those unfortunately are offered at any other level than this program. Um, and then financial options, again, talk to financial aid. I can't speak as much to sort of the different, different loans and things like that. We will have some scholarship funds. And then again, you know, once you're in the program, we will, and we'll have graduate assistantships as well, which are more just um, a paid intern or not paid internship. It's a paid assistantship. It doesn't come with any tuition reduction. Um, and then once you're in the program, you'll be able to be eligible to, to um, apply for adjunct positions and, um, and then fund the program that way. Our adjunct positions pay about $7,500 for a class. So if you did, you know, one of those every quarter or so, or a couple, maybe a couple in the summer, we're actually trying to, um, we're trying to free up summers from actual coursework so students can teach, take on some adjunct positions in the summer and work on research in the summer. Um, so if you think about it that way, you can almost cover your tuition every quarter by teaching an adjunct class. Can people with no counseling masters enroll in this? I have tech and management degrees. So one of the requirements is to have a counseling degree. Um, so I think maybe that would be a great question for to reach out to Krista and kind of give us some more background. If you don't have a counseling degree or it's not KCREP accredited, get in touch with us so that we can help determine your eligibility. But this is really extending on the master's in counseling. So you would want to have that master's in counseling before this. All right. Okay. Could you give us examples of research topics for this program? Like, does it have to be specific to counselor education or could it be just topics that may help counselors in general? Oh my gosh, what a great question. Um, we want you to do all kinds of research. So we, you know, there's counselor education research and we love, and really the, pro the profession is moving towards find, you know, getting more outcome-based research. So what are things that are working with clients? What, or, or understanding new, new client populations or populations that we've not um, historically had a good understanding of and haven't been investigated at the same level. So working with, you know, clinical populations to do your research is fantastic. Um, if you have other ideas about like, hey, you know, I'm very curious about this education program. Like, how does this work? How are we training students to be counselors? How, what are best ways to supervise or train? Um, it can really run the gamut, like right? a huge spectrum of research topics from counselor education to clinical work. Um, so yeah, we hope you have lots of creative ideas and that you can come in and sort of see what 
you're most interested in and kind of narrow it down and begin working with it. And sometimes you start working with a topic and you're like, ah, this is not as, this isn't really what I thought it was going to be. So I'm going to switch to something new and that's totally fine. We have a lot of flexibility for you to be able to do that. You're going to get to play. Think about our classes as like sandboxes. So you'll start with your first research class and you'll just get to like read about the topics that you're interested in and kind of play around with them and see, is this something that I want to do? And then in your next course, you'll get to play around with it more or tinker with it and change it a bit. And then, you know, every research class you go into, you build on the work you've done in the previous class. And so you can, you know, add to it, you can change it, um, you can strengthen it. So that's a great question. Any idea how this being a brand new program will affect GI Bill? Um, that's a great question. I don't know the answer to that, but if we can go back, yes. So Krista just put Lisa Harris's um, information in the chat box. I don't know of any reason why this wouldn't um, be eligible for GI Bill certification because it is accredited by WASC, which is the regional accrediting body. And, you, and usually that is what um, the, the VA wants to see. So um, but I'm going to have you contact Lisa and get in touch with her for your specific questions on that. I don't want to advise anybody incorrectly. I've not been told that we're not eligible for a mill for GI bill. So yeah, thanks, Daniel. Any other questions? These are great questions. Y'all have given me a lot to think about. Um, we want, want you to encourage, I want to encourage you to reach out to us to let us know what questions you have. Um, we are thrilled with this program and um, it's a bit of a, like a, a you know, we're, we're kind of building things, really building out a lot of detail this year um, as we're preparing for y'all to get here next year. And so uh, if you have questions, please let us know um, because we want to um, be prepared for you. What are you looking for in applicants? Yeah. So we are really just looking for people to be our future colleagues in higher education, out in the field. Um, you know, we are working with, uh, all kinds of folks, uh, masters, supervisors, and, um, you know, just think about all the folks you've came into, you've come into contact with through your clinical internship. Um, that's really what we're looking for. We're looking for people who are open to learning and, um, you know, be, um, just, I think, be ready and flexible and interested in learning and researching. And you don't have to be an expert at any of that. Um, that's really normal for folks to come in without any research experience and be nervous about it. Um, so don't let that hold you back. Uh, this is all very doable. Uh, and yeah, so will there be more than one cohort if the interest is high? Um, at this point, no, we're, 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 at, we've designed that number in mind with the current faculty that we have available and all of that. Um, I mean, that number might be a little bit flexible, but um, we're going to have enroll folks every year. So we anticipate that, you know, if um, this doesn't work out for you this year, then the following year we'll, we'll still be here trucking along. So um, yeah. So thank you so much for everyone being here today. We'll stick around for questions. I appreciate seeing so many of you coming back to, um, to say hi and check it out. And thanks to all these new faces. Neil, great to see you again. Um, it's great to have all of you here. Please let us know if you have any questions. We are thrilled that you're here and want to help you make your decision, the best decision, that, the decision that's right for you. So. Let us know how, what information you need from us to do that.